And let's stand as we pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful this morning for your grace, for your goodness. We're thankful for one another. We're thankful for you bringing us here on this occasion, and we pray that you would bless our time together. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So I'm going to ask Jerry if he would come and sing for us, please. A river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and got saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. <coughs> the past are broken at last I got saved oh I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right he got a hold of my life I got Jesus how could I Christ's grace. I was so lost till I fell at his cross and got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got trouble in chapter 5 and it's the start of his troubles for a long time for the rest of his ministry he's in trouble with the with the religious establishment John chapter 5 and we'll start with verse 1 as soon as I find John 
I had the other book that John wrote, one of the other books, I turned to it, it's Revelation. Chapter 5 is one of my favorite chapters, Revelation chapter 5. John chapter 5. Sometime later, an undefined time, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now, there is in Jerusalem, now he was in Galilee, and I want to explain this for just a moment. He was in Galilee, and Jerusalem is south of Galilee. So when he says he went up to Jerusalem, there's a reason that it says he went up to Jerusalem. Now, ordinarily, we would say he went down. The ships come out of Lake Superior, they're going down, they're going south. They, they lower, the lakes lower. Um, it means that Jerusalem is on, built on a hill and everybody that goes to Jerusalem goes up, up to Jerusalem. You'll find in scripture it's always up to Jerusalem because it's built on a hill, which cities were built on a hill purposely because that was the best defensive position to be in. It's built on a hill. If you look at, at the old stone house and, and the, the block house beside it, the block house is up. And that's a better defensive position than on the level. And so that's why Jerusalem was built on the hill. Now I've lost my place. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered col colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for about 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pond when the water is stirred while I'm trying to get in. Somebody else goes down ahead of me, Jesus said to him. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your, your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Just that far in, in God's word this morning. I'm going to ask Jerry to come and sing for us. So this next song is um, a story. For those of new people who may have never heard this before, it's an oldie, okay? This is... Um, falls under the category probably of country gospel. I can hear it. Tennis here any four is singing it right now. But anyways, there were 99 sheep and one got lost. Although the road be 
prophet's steed. I go to the desert to find my sheep. I go to the desert to find my sheep. But none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters he crossed. All dark was the night that the Lord passed through till he found his sheep that was lost. Well, out in the desert he heard its cry, sick and helpless and ready to die. Sick and helpless and ready to die. Lord, whence are those blood drops all the way that mark out your mountain trek? They were shed for one who had gone astray so the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, whence are thy hands so torn and rent? They're pierced tonight by many a thorn. They're pierced tonight by many a thorn. And then all through the mountains, thunder riven, and up from the rocky steep, there arose a glad cry to the very gates of heaven. Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around God's throne. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Rejoice, for the Lord, he brings back his own. Thank God for that. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. By the way, that, that hymn is not in our hymn book. It is in the Sankey hymn book, in case you wondered. If you have, if you have a Sankey hymn book, um, the 1909. And of course, the most famous Canadian that, that sang the 1909 was George Beverly Shea, who sang it at Billy Graham Crusades. Perhaps you didn't know that Billy Graham had a Canadian singing for him, but he did. You just do it better. John chapter 5. We have here a story where Jesus begins his troubles, his conflicts. And he goes from Galilee down south to Jerusalem and then up into the city and he went up to Jerusalem for a feast. It doesn't say what feast. It doesn't matter what feast. It's not the Passover. We've determined it wasn't the Passover. We, don't, we can't determine exactly which one it is. It was one of the three feasts that Jewish males were required to attend. And he came into the city and there before him was the sheep gate and there was a, a pool where the disabled lay. It was a place of despondency. It was a place where there was no immediate prospect for healing. The only prospect for healing was to jump into the pool when the water was stirred. And there was a, a thing, a, a a folk tale that said when the water was stirred, if you jumped into the pool first, you'd be healed. We don't know. Some variants on the text say that angels stirred it. I have no reason not to say no, they didn't. I, they might have. It also might have been a, a Roman pipe coming in there. Who knows? Something stirred the water in the people made a dash. As much as disabled and sick people can make a dash for the water. It was a place of despondency and despair and almost hopelessness. As the people lay there, 
this one man had been trying this for 38 years to no, to no avail. And Jesus comes to, notice where Jesus comes. Jerry just sang about it. He sang about the one that was lost. Not the 99 that were left in the fold, but the one that was lost. Jesus came to where lost people were. And he says to, and he comes into this place of despondency, the giver of life comes into this place of despondency and he just, are, we don't know, we don't think that anything that Jesus did was arbitrary. We don't think that, do we? No, we don't think that. This person was chosen by Jesus for the question, do you want to get well? And we find out later that this man had no idea who was talking to him. He didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know anything about Jesus. And there was this strange man that asked me, do you want to get well? What are you going to say? What are you going to say? I'm going to, I would say, yes, I do. But can, how can you do that? How can you help me do that? This man says, he explains. He goes on, when, sir, notice he doesn't say Lord or Master which is the traditional title for Jesus. He had no idea who was talking to him. And the man replied, I have no one to help me into the water when the water is stirred while I'm trying to get in. Somebody else goes down ahead of me. Do you want to get well? Well, the only way I can get well is to go into that water. Isn't that interesting? He had already decided that the only way he was going to get well was to get into that water when the water was stirred. He couldn't think outside the box. He couldn't think that maybe God could do something huge, much bigger than he could think. We tend to be that way, human beings. We think God will do it this way. This is the only way that God will do it. Yeah? This is the way. When... When I was um, in Bible college, one of the one of the arguments, discussions, discussions. Let's leave it there. Was how should we evangelize? Was Billy Graham doing it right, or should we go door to door? Was the bus ministry doing it right? Well, who was doing it right? Who was evangelizing correctly? That was the question. Because there were critics of Billy Graham, there were critics of the bus ministry, there were critics of door-to-door -door ministry, there were critics of people. I had a friend um, who, who went with open-air campaigners, and he used to do outdoor ministry. He used to set up and, and preach on the street. And there were critics of that. Because we were thinking, God only does it this way. Someone once said, it's not very hard for Jesus to save someone. Any way we do it is just fine. As long as we're, as long as we're telling people about Jesus. It's fine. Do you want to do it door to door? You go right ahead. That's not looked on too kindly anymore. But because of various other factions took it away from us, but anyway, if you want to do it on the street, that's fine. If you're Billy Graham and can do it to thousands and thousands of people on a single night, that's fine. My boss at Prairie, when I joined the staff at Prairie, I was part of the art department, and my boss, Brian Parlane, had been saved, guess where? at a Billy Graham crusade in Toronto. And he was my boss in Alberta. And um, when he told me that, I just, that ends all arguments against this method or that method. What really matters is you're telling someone about Jesus. Do it the way that you can do it. Do it the best way you know how to. 
And that's the lesson here. Do you want to get well? Well, sir, I want to get well, but in the way that I think I'm going to get well. No, do you want to get well? I got it. Jesus had it. Here was the Lord of life asking this man to get well, and he, and he, he can't think outside the box. So fine. And Jesus, um, the interesting thing, the second interesting thing here, is there's no faith involved. This man didn't know who Jesus was. This man didn't exercise any faith, any hope. He was still hopeless. Jesus comes into the hopeless and gives them hope, but they don't see him. Do we, do we sometimes not see the hand of God working? We, yeah, we don't see the hand of God working. Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. None of those things could he do. None of those things could he do. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Couldn't do any of those things. Zero. And Jesus tells him to do all of them. Three things. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. And what at once. Immediately, immediately, not, not next week or a week, two weeks later, the man was cured. Immediately. Jesus had this, had, he was the Lord of life. To cure this person who was disabled wasn't hard. At his word, he was cured. The man stood up, picked up his mat, and walked. Here is Jesus coming in to the place, the unknown, unknown person coming in and healing the disabled man, the lame man, however he was disabled. And he healed him immediately. He did not heal everybody. I want us to understand that, that he did not heal everybody. He healed one person. And he walked. There was no faith involved in the part of the man. Which leads us to another lesson. There's many lessons. There's no faith involved on the part of the man. God is not limited by our lack of faith. God is not limited by our lack of faith or nothing else. Nothing would ever happen. He just, he's not limited. He's not limited by our sin. He's not limited by our lack of faith. He's not limited. God is working. How many people have gone into a hospital that was started as a, a Christian hospital? How many people have gone in to a hospital started by believers? and operated by those who love the Lord and found themselves cared for and healed in that hospital by the power of God Himself. Because God's the only one who ultimately heals. He has made our body so that it heals. It can heal. He sends doctors to help it along. How many people have walked in with no faith in God has worked and they don't even know it? How many people are walking the streets of Sault Ste. Marie and not realize what, what work God has done here now and in the past and has no clue? But they are benefiting from the work of God. And so this man went up and he walked and he went into the temple because he was healed. And so he had to do the proper thing. When you, when you got healed, you had to go to the temple and sacrifice. And so when he got there, he was carrying his mat. And the Pharisees, which is here, here we have the, the number two point. First point's the cure. Second point's the conflict. When you get healed, what kind of day is that? It's the day of joy. 
It's a day of jubilation. It's a day of celebration. I got healed. It's a day of excitement. And he went into the temple. Obviously, they had seen him there at the, as disabled, and now he was walking, and he came into the temple, and, and the Pharisees were on him in a minute. And for some reason, their legalism and their, their rules are blocking their celebration for this man, their joy, and all they can see. They don't see the, he, the healed man. They see the mat. He's carrying the mat. On the Sabbath. Oh, I can't allow that. Can't allow that. No carrying the mats on the Sabbath. No, no, no. Can't allow that. They say, well, why are you carrying your mat? You can't carry your mat on the Sabbath. Talk about putting, putting cold water on joy. How many times has someone put cold water on joy because of something they think, of some point of legalism, of some rule that they created in, in the middle of the night? How many times have we seen that happen? We put, we put cold water on someone's joy John Kaiser tells a story of a church that ran a little youth program. And, and they said, well, why don't we try to, we're going to get a youth pastor and try to expand the youth program. And they can have the church for this particular night and see what happens. And so they had, they had this, they started this program and, and they were coming out, they were coming out like the, by buckets, there were youth. And in that program, in one week, in two weeks, three young people got saved. There's only one word for that, hallelujah. Three young people found Christ. And only one window got broken. <coughs> it's a thing. And so the elders decided in their wisdom that they had to stop the program because they didn't want any more windows broken. <coughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't see what was happening in that youth program. Three people got saved. How many people, how many people have those elders led to the Lord recently? And here three young people got saved. Only one window got broken. Gordon can fix windows. We don't worry about that. Sometimes our rules put up a barrier to our joy, to our seeing God's working. They put up a barrier. And this is... If we, if we learn nothing else, let's not put up barriers between us and seeing God working. Because there's a lot of them. There's, there's a lot of barriers that can be thought of. The Pharisees' barrier was the Sabbath and what you could do or couldn't do on the Sabbath. They made a book full of rules for the Sabbath. The idea of the Sabbath was you couldn't work. By the way, Sunday is not the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. Sunday is the Lord's Day. It is the day of resurrection. And that's why we worship on Sunday because it is the day of resurrection. This is the day that the Lord has made specifically for Himself. And so that's why we worship on Sunday. And so... The Pharisees asked the man, well, who, who, who told you to get up and walk and, and carry your mat? Who told you to do that? We're going to get him. And the man said, well, I don't know. I don't know. Some guy. At the, yeah, some guy. Some guy. And Jesus went back into the temple in, in a little while. And he found him. 
then he said, um, See you are well again. Stop singing. Or something worse may happen to you. There's a lesson number, I don't know what number we're at. But Jesus, Jesus knew the condition of this man's heart. Did I tell you that our sin does not prevent God's working? Our lack of faith does not prevent God's working. He wants us to trust Him completely, but He'll work. He wants, us, he wants this man to stop sinning. I don't know what this man's sin was. I don't know how many sins you can get into trouble with when you're disabled. I don't know how, how, what his thing was. But Jesus says, stop it. Or else something worse might happen to you. And so, don't do this. Stop what you're doing. And so Jesus now is looking for repentance. He's looking for some, some reaction to the fact that he's healed this man. He's looking for repentance to stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. And follow Christ. Stop what you're doing and follow Christ. It's a simple, it's a simple thing but John puts it in the most simple of ways. The rest talk about repentance and believing. And John just says, stop doing what you're doing. And the man, the man went away and told me. Now, this man was not a pleasant man. He was not... But don't you have to be pleasant before Jesus can save you? No. Unfortunately, no. You don't have to, don't you have to straighten your life out before Jesus can get a hold of you? No. You know, Jesus gets a hold of anybody and everybody. And like I said at the beginning, he finds it easy to save people. The Holy Spirit. And so the man went away and immediately went to the Jews to tell on Jesus. You see, he wanted to get, he wanted to stay out of trouble, so he was going to throw Jesus under the bus. This is the man whom Jesus healed, and he was going to throw Jesus under the bus with the Pharisees. Jesus didn't particularly care, but it's interesting. It's interesting this man that Jesus chose to heal wasn't the nicest man in the world. Didn't react all that great. But Jesus healed him. What a, what a wonderful Savior we have. What a God we have. And the Pharisees found Jesus and said, you can't be doing this on the Sabbath. You can't be working on the Sabbath. You shouldn't be healing on the Sabbath. There was nothing wrong with healing on the Sabbath, by the way. There was no rule against it. Oh, they had made their own rule. But God hadn't made the rule. The problem is not God's rules. The problem is our rules, that we add to God's rules. There's a, there's a house up the top of the hill coming on to McNabb from down from St. George. You know, the hill comes up. And there's a house there. And it's got this big block wall in front of it. And you wonder, why does it have that block wall in front of it? Well, for the same reason that the office building at the corner of East and, well and Wellington has a big block wall in front of it. To prevent the cars that are going to come into your house from coming into your house. They're going to crash into the wall before they get to the house. That's the idea. It had, 
That particular one on McNabb there, that's been hit several times. The, the office building down on the corner of East and, and Wellington has been hit a couple of times. They built a big block wall, like big blocks going to stop, big rocks going to stop the car. Hopefully it stops the car. By the way, I've noticed that when the car gets stopped, they find another building to hit, so <laughs> it, it's just. <clears throat> but that's what the Pharisees had done with the law. They had built fences and block walls around it so that you never got near to what God intended. So they built all these rules. They had pages and books and, of rules so that you don't dare break one of God's laws. In fact, you couldn't even get close to breaking one of God's laws. And probably their intentions were good, but uh, when Jesus got here, he showed them how poorly it worked out in practice. How poorly it worked out in practice. Let God speak for himself. You don't need necessarily to always speak for him. And so, here Jesus, Jesus says to them, when, when they started to shake their fingers at him and get angry at him because he was healing on the Sabbath, Jesus said, my, my father's always had his work to this very day. My, in other words, God is my father and he's working today. He works. He works. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. He works for, for, on behalf of his creation, on behalf of his people on behalf of, for his glory, he works. And so we find, and I too am working. I and the Father are one. I'm working as well as my Father. We're working together. And the Pharisees got really angry with that because Jesus made himself equal with God. Jesus revealed himself publicly that he was equal with God, that he was God the Son. Oh, Lord. 
Thank you so much, Jerry. Let's stand as we pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your songs. Lord, we're so pleased to be with one another, to be able to fellowship together, to be able to chat together. Lord, we just thank you. And as we go through this week, may you be glorified in our lives and in our city. We just thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. You may be dismissed. Like that.